T-bone journal entry number two. Um, thankfully, still feeling pretty good. Uh, I have slight nausea now, but it's pretty manageable. I haven't actually thrown up. Um, I'm just trying to be careful with different things that I eat or drink because certain things just make me feel a little pukey afterwards. Um, my taste is still pretty intact. Um, still just dealing with the dry mouth and the neuropathy and all of that. So when I walk, it feels like I'm like walking on like it feels like I'm walking on nothing kind of or just like the edges of my feet are all I can feel when I'm walking but uh still holding in on all those things and grateful that that's kind of all I've experienced so far we're now about 50 hours in but I figured I would share a little bit about just how I'm feeling on the postpartum side of things with um the chemo and trying to deal with like postpartum stuff as well. So when all of our plans obviously got very derailed, we had planned to do a birth at a birthing center. Um, then obviously with this ended up birthing in a hospital, but they had really wanted me to do a vaginal birth because it would be better for handling and, you know, dealing with the chemo, um, without being recovering from a C-section scar, but alas, she was born via emergency C-section. Um, so in some ways that has made some of the postpartum stuff easier, a lot of it harder, um, just with starting the chemo up, but, um, specifically kind of wanted to share just a little bit about breastfeeding and chemo and all of that stuff. So my intention uh, before all of this was to breastfeed pretty much as long as I could. Um, and one of my biggest fears was that my milk just wouldn't come in and I wouldn't have a hard time breastfeeding. And my body, I think, just wants to laugh at me because my milk came in wonderfully. I am now three to four days in after my milk came in. Um, I was able to get a lot of colostrum in the beginning, which was great. I'm grateful that I was able to do that. Um, but we did know that I was going to be basically not able to breastfeed, even pump really because of the way everything was planned out. I got my port put in, which meant I had anesthesia. Um, and I would have had to wait 24 hours to be able to pump any milk. Um, and there was like a four hour window of time that I could have pumped something to get to her. But we ultimately decided to just, once my milk came in, try and start drying up uh, so that I didn't have, so that I wasn't trying to pump, be on chemo, um, all of those things. And that was just the decision we made. There are options if you have cancer are on chemo and want to continue breastfeeding. Um, ideally, that's what I really wanted to do, but it just, I just didn't feel like I could put my body through that for however long we're going to have to be on the chemo. There, I had to go up. It was driving me crazy. But um, there are options if you want to try and continue to breastfeed after the chemo is over. Um, one of the options I could have done was chosen to pump throughout all of the chemo, but everything I pump would have had to be dumped. So you, you know, we don't want the baby to get any of the chemo that's going into my breast milk and just not knowing how the chemo was going to affect me and knowing I needed sleep and to let my body rest. We just made the decision to go ahead and give her the colostrum that I was able to get. And then after that, uh, eventually we will be formula feeding which wasn't our plan. Um, I, like I said, I was hoping to breastfeed for at least a year. Um, and I really wanted her to have that. Um, and I wanted that experience with her. Um, so it did kind of feel a little, like I said, a little just like my body was laughing at me just because like I was able to get milk. <laughs> my milk came in and it I've been leaking everywhere for days. Um, 
but it's slowly starting to dry up now. Um, I haven't had thankfully any issues with mastitis or anything, um, but my milk did come in, which I was grateful for because it showed me like my body was going to work to do what I you know wanted to do with her. And so maybe in the future, if we have another child, which after all of this, she may be an only one, but um, maybe I'll get to have that experience then. Or one of the other things that I know is going to be really hard to do, and it probably won't happen, but if we get, you know, six months in and my chemo's all done, um, then you still have to wait. I think it's another three, it's either three weeks or three months that they want you to wait before you try and start breastfeeding. I would need to look that up, but, um, we thought about maybe ha trying to work to get my milk to come back in, but I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, it's just been, you know, it's a lot on your body to be on chemo. And then, like I said, you can pump, but you're pumping two to three you know, every two to three hours, then one to two pumps at night, um, and just trying to get rest and get sleep when I can, and then thinking about trying to do that, we just had to make the decision to not breastfeed. Um, the good thing about where she is here in the NICU, um, they use donor milk, which I'm so happy about. Um, they use donor milk up until 34 weeks. And the other thing we had asked them about was continuing to use donor milk. Um, you know, basically, could we continue to use donor milk after the 34 weeks? And their recommendation from a preemie perspective is that no, mom's milk is best, then formula, and then it would be donor milk. And the way they explained it makes absolute sense. Um because your body knows what your baby needs. They, it knows the calorie count it needs, you know, all of those things, whether your baby's fighting something off, then your milk needs to produce, you know, what it needs to do to help them fight it. Your body knows that, which is why they recommend mom's milk first. And then if you're not able to use mom's milk formula, um, is recommended next because of the caloric intake. Whereas if you used a donor breast milk, there it's not, it's one, it's highly pasteurized. So um, it's taking some of the, you know, some of the nutrients get lost. Um, but it's also fit for that baby that, you know, that's being, the milk is being donated from. So it may not have the things that our baby needs to be able to help her continue to grow. And so we've done, well, I say we, uh, my wonderful sister-in-law has done quite a bit of research on formula and just what's closest to mom's milk, have as few preservatives and additives as possible. Um, so we, right now, especially for a preemie, it was kind of hard to find, but she found this one. It's called Hip Organic, and it's actually out of Europe, um, so we're going to have to check with the NICU and ask them if they will let us use that one because it's technically not FDA approved in the United States. Um, and if they let us use it, I will let you know. Otherwise we'll just use the one that they have there right now, um, that they give their preemies and then we'll use this one once we get home. Um, we looked at that one and then the other one was called whole H O L L E. Uh, but they do not have anything specific for preemies. So the hip um, is the one we're going to start with. Uh, if it doesn't agree with her as she gets a little older, we'll pull in, we'll try the whole. Both of them are from Europe, uh, and they just have the fewest additives and preservatives and are as organic as, you know, possible. Um it stinks a little bit that it's hard to find that in the United States. Um, just a lot of the formula here includes a bunch of other crap that we don't want her, you know, to necessarily get. Um, we want stuff that's good on her gut and just that's what we found. So we're going to go with those. They are fairly expensive, so, you know. 
greatness, but it is what it is. And we're, you know, just going to move forward with that and she's worth it. So that's what we're choosing to do. Um, but again, not what we envisioned, not what we wanted, but we're just moving along in the best way we can. Um, but that's, you know, our plan for her. Uh, but what I have done to kind of help me dry up, it's been also an adventure and a journey. Uh, every time I think I'm dry, I'm not. Uh, what I've been doing is a little peek of the breast pads, which are actually just made from the postpartum pads we had here at the hospital. Um, I didn't even think to bring like actual breast pads because I really hadn't thought like I figured, yeah, if I was pumping or if I was going to try and give her milk, it would take me longer to dry up. And so I would need to wean and have those. But I, in my mind, I just figured if I'm not breastfeeding or I'm not going to start pumping, it won't take that long for my milk to dry up. That is not the case at least for me, it just, they just kept going. Um, when they, when my book first came in, I was pretty engorged, not to the point where I was like in pain, but just that it was really hard and really uncomfortable. Um, and for that first day it didn't really leak. Um, but then by the next day it was just like the milk was wanting to come out. <laughs> um, and so just know if you're, in the midst of, I'm sure this is probably also just a postpartum thing if your partner is as supportive as babe is, but you're going to get really intimate really quickly uh, in ways that, you know, he just doesn't usually help me with my bathroom needs. Um, but he, we took the pads that were in the package of stuff that the hospital gives us, cut them in half, and then I just taped them to both of my boobs to make a pad to stop the leakage. Uh, the lactation consultants here also recommended getting cabbage. So we did that. My mom went to the store, picked up some cabbage and we just tear them into pieces, stick them on each boob and then just leave them there. Uh, and that's supposed to help draw the milk out, help your milk supply go down and then ice packs. So I also had these lovely things. They're actually um, instant cold therapy for your vagina, but I, because I had a C-section, I didn't need that. Um, that area felt fine. I did use it once um, as a pad to help just that as well. Um, and also when I used it, it did take a little bit of like the sensation away from my c-section scar because I was focusing more on the cold and my crotch um, but I only used one and then since then I've been using them for here because they also recommended using ice pad ice packs to help so this is like a glow stick kind of you basically just break it in half until you hear it pop and then shake it and it makes it cold um, and so I was putting them on here all the way across to give myself a little bit of the cold, but also to help with any leakage. And I wore that down um, like one of the days that I went down and did skin to skin with her because pretty much every time I went and held her skin to skin before I started the chemo, um, I would just leak. You know, she was there. She was on me. My body wanted to feed her. And so... It just leaked, but this helped to, one, keep ice on my boobs and to catch any of the leakage. So it's something to use if you have it. Um, like I said, it's the Freedom Bob Instant Cold Therapy Pads. So I used those um, until I started getting ice packs from the nurses. I would get like the big ice packs and just stick one here and one here, and that helped you know, the inflammation and continued to help dry up my milk. Um, it's, pr I'm pretty much, like I said, I'm into the fourth day and I'm pretty much dry now, I think. 
Uh, I still have the pads on, but I don't have any cabbage in right now. Uh, but with the cabbage, basically what you'll do, like I said, you'll tear off a piece of the cabbage. You're going to want to like kind of crunch it a little bit. So you kind of pop the veins so that they're more absorbent. Um, and then you just stick them on. Uh, I would stick them either just right on my boobs without the pads, but then it almost kind of created like a waterfall effect. And so it was dripping down my side. Um, what I would do is put the pad on, make sure you're catching, like the tape is down at the lower part of the pad, uh, and so that it's catching any of the waterfall effect coming off of the cabbage. But I feel like this is just a very rambling message about boobs. Uh, but that's about it. Cold compresses, ice packs, cabbage, and just give yourself time and grace because that's really the only option is patience. And I would get really frustrated sometimes when I would take the pads off. I had taken the pads off one day and just used paper towels because I was like, it's got to be, it's got to be dry. That was yesterday and it just wasn't. And I got a little frustrated, but just tried to keep reminding myself there's really nothing that I, you know, can do. I've got to just let my body do what it needs to do. Um, going and standing in a warm shower just kind of helps me too. So I would just go and stand in there and just remember that this is a road that I've never walked before and that's okay to get frustrated, but to also just give myself the space to be good to myself, I guess. Um, so just know if you're going through chemo and trying to figure out what you're going to do about breastfeeding or drying up your milk, or you're just having a hard time with breastfeeding and getting your milk to stop, you're not alone. I just keep reminding myself there are other women who have, you know, walked this path before me and just trying to keep a good mindset, uh, and not get too discouraged that I'm not able to use the milk that was coming in. Um, this whole journey is different than anything we'd planned. And just trying to go with it with as much grace as, a, as possible. Um, but that's just the decisions we made for ourselves to not breastfeed or not pump and dump for, you know, the next six months. Um, but know that if that's something that's really, that you really want to try to do, that is an option. Um, and I guess that's it. <laughs> Breastfeeding talk, chat, all done. Bye guys.